the incredible story of Jonah. Thank you, Pastor Derek, for your leadership last week, getting us kicked off. So clear, so strong. What a great day this is going to be. The Lord has something so special for you. I want to pray again for all of our college students that are away at a retreat this weekend. There are 300 college students gathered in a Columbus Conference and Retreat Center from Ohio State, UC, probably Case Western also. And uh, just pray that God does something rich in their lives. There will be some who give their lives to the Lord this weekend. And uh, dozens of our leaders are there with them tonight, or today. Father, do your work in their lives as you will in Jesus' name. And everyone said, the reason we add fasting to our quarterly weeks of prayer and fasting <laughs> is because the Bible teaches that fasting humbles our flesh. And when our flesh or our sin nature, our humanity, our self is humbled, the Spirit of God praying through us is leveraged, increased, uh, amplified. And the reason we gather on Wednesday nights to come together and pray and fast together is because that collective creates an exponential lift of intensity in the prayer life going up from the church. And the reason we pray scriptures and specific prayer points throughout the week, like in the email Pastor Ali told you we would get tomorrow, is because as we pray the scriptures together and those prayer points, even though we're not in the same room, there's, again, this, this collective uh, symphonic work of prayer that is going up, moving heaven, things in heaven and on earth. The power of prayer. The church of Jesus Christ is called to be a house of prayer for all nations and of all nations. So I'm excited about this week. It's an exercise that maybe you're just getting started in, but fasting food is hard. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. But it's because, <laughs> there, there are a lot of hallelujahs on there. <laughs> Amen. That means you've tried fasting. You've already exercised those muscles. It's a spiritual discipline because it's hard. And it's, it's, it's essential because we grow ourselves in spirit and in truth as we fast. And more is accomplished in the heavenlies when the church humbles itself to pray. So I'm excited for you. I'm proud of you. Uh, follow doctor's orders about fasting. Some of us fast uh, uh, like 24 hours eating in the evening and then fast another until that evening. Some of us do three-day fast. Some do seven-day fast, total fast. Uh, some are only able to fast one meal a day. But fasting food is biblical fasting. That's what it is. And it's, it's amazing in your life. And I, I'm praying for you this week as you exercise fasting. Jonah, called by God, gifted by God, but uncooperative with his purposes. Not unlike us, right? A lot of times. Not unlike us. That's one of the things I like about Jonah is that I can identify so many of my own attributes in him. Not that that's the way my attributes are all the time. But, you know, through your life, you go through seasons. You go through different times when things are clicking better than others. You're walking in obedience more, more powerfully, more strongly than other times. Uh, you're experiencing the presence of God in your life more powerfully and, and stronger than at other times. And Jonah has this same kind of thing going on in his life throughout. And there are key lessons for us each to draw from for our own lives. Also this, um, how we read the Word of God, it matters because reading it to really understand and to learn is what makes change in our lives. So I want to just pray for this time in His Word, okay? Father, I pray that like when the psalmist writes, Holy Spirit, make your Word come alive to me, that today... 
your word would become alive, would come alive to us for changing us, for growing us more deeply in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of the things I personally like to do as I, as I read the Bible for my, my, own, uh, my own life, um, there are times I'm reading for teaching, but m- honestly, most of my time in the Word is, is, to, is to grow in, in the Lord, my own personal devotions or abiding time. And one of the things that I like to do, and I want to tell you about it because I think it might, it might be helpful to you too, is letting Scripture inform other Scriptures. So whenever you come across something in, in, in a chapter that you're reading and it reminds you of something somewhere else, it's good to actually stop and go look at that and then come back and look at what you started with. And that, that letting Scripture inform Scripture is one of the ways that the Holy Spirit, working in you, helps make his word come alive to you. And one of the easiest ways to do it is when reading the words of Jesus and he's quoting from an Old Testament book or passage, you stop and go and look at it and read it and then come back to what you're seeing Jesus talk about. One of the the tools that I use is an app called Blue Letter Bible. Has anybody here heard of that app? There are other digital apps for, for the Bible. But in addition to having my, my hard copy and my time of reading, I'll, I'll go on that app when I have a question or when I want to look at something in a different translation than what I have. Or when I'm reading and I, I, I realize Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament it's easy in, in my Blue Letter Bible app to pull that scripture up and it'll have a, a highlighted footnote. It'll be a hot link and I click it and it says Isaiah 58 or it says Psalm 119. It'll tell me where he's quoting from. Jesus quotes the Bible a lot <laughs> as he's talking. And so I'll go then and look at that and let what's happening there, what I read in that, set of verses inform what, what, how I'm understanding what Jesus is saying. So that's letting the Bible inform or interpret the Bible. And it's a, an amazing way to read Scripture. And now, you, you might not want to use a Bible app. You just have your Bible in print. But at the bottom, a lot of our Bibles have footnotes. And you'll often see where uh, something that's being... Uh, uh, that's, that Jesus is saying is, is indented, and that's because he's quoting from the Old Testament. And you can go right down to the bottom of the page and find the reference, what scripture he's, he's quoting. So, for example, what I want to look at now is comparing or doing a contrast between Jonah and Jesus for today's message. Did you know Jesus quotes uh, or speaks about Jonah? Did you know that? I want to I show that to us. It happens when this religious crowd, this self-righteous, critical group is coming against him. They were jealous of him. Jesus was a young, younger man, but having influence that was growing month by month and year by year. He, he had started teaching from Scripture and speaking about the kingdom of God. And he would come, when he came to Jerusalem, he would go to like the University of Jerusalem at the temple where the experts in the law were doing their teaching. But he would have crowds of hundreds and hundreds and they'd have an itty bitty crowd. And they were jealous. And they were jealous of, of just how clearly he could quote scripture and the and the meaning that he would draw from it and the challenges that he would give especially against people who were full of pride Jesus was constantly like chipping away at the idea of and the practice of pride in us and in the religious elite at, at that time and at that day and and Jesus at this one moment he's teaching and these this critical group comes up to him to push him back and to kind of 
take him off of his game. And it says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, that some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. I think they used the, the word teacher with sarcasm. And Jesus answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. He's like, <laughs> comes right at him. But none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. The ones that repented in Nineveh who had been far from God are going to be better off on the day of judgment than you are. He's basically saying to them. <laughs> For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now something even greater than Jonah is here and you're not hearing it. Whoa. Jesus and Jonah. Yeah, you're going to get a sign all right. <laughs> you see, Jesus was comparing the idea that he would be buried in a tomb like Jonah spent three days in the belly of a great fish. But the comparison is not equal, and that's what I want to talk about here today. First, Jesus. Jesus was called called by God, really sent by God, the Messiah. The word Messiah actually means one who is sent. He was gifted, full of talent. Jesus wowed the audiences wherever he taught and ministered because of his eloquence, his wisdom, his understanding, even as a, a young 30-year-old, 30 31, 32-year-old, as he taught over the next couple of years after beginning. Jesus wasn't impressive by the virtue of having uh, or being the son of the living God. This is an important point. Because Jesus had laid aside all of his so-called, you know, we might call them superpowers. He had laid aside his his God powers to become exactly like us in flesh and bone with the same temptations that we have, with the same weaknesses that we have. He would get tired. <laughs> he could probably even get cranky. <laughs> the difference is that while living in flesh and bone, he still obeyed the Father and he didn't sin against the Lord or against people. But just like you and me, he had the Holy Spirit in him. If you are in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you. And so just like us, when he would minister, he did it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, not out of his deity. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? We know this to be true from the book of Philippians, where it says Jesus did not consider equality with God at all, but instead emptied himself to become just like us, human, and to become a servant, obedient to God even unto death on a cross. So he was fully like us. Even while he kept the essence of being the Son of God, he didn't keep the powers of being the Son of God. Except in the same way that's available to you and me, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is also available to us when you believe in Jesus. Jesus was called. Jesus was gifted. You're gifted. You're talented. You're unique. Jesus was obedient. Now, this is where the contrast with Jonah starts to 
reveal itself. The comparison breaks down. Jesus fulfilled the desires of the Father. In fact, Jesus said at times, he said, I'm only doing what the Father shows me to do. Everything that I'm doing is something that I already saw him doing. That's what I'm doing. He, he, he was aligning himself in his humanity with God the Father through his prayer life and through knowing the Word and then living out what God the Father was putting in his heart to do. So he was in agreement. He lived his life in agreement with God's purposes, God's redemptive life-giving, people-loving purposes. Which is the last thing that I wanted to highlight. He loved people so much that he loved them at cost to himself. He loved people sacrificially. It's easy to want to have a feeling of love for someone, but to not expend anything on their behalf. Love, I have a friend who always signs his emails, is a verb. (laughs) Love is an action of sacrifice for the betterment of another. Now Jonah, let's go to the book of Jonah, chapter 2. Jonah was a prophet living 700 years earlier. Can you imagine when Jonah is writing this, Peter says that the prophets knew that they were writing for us. They wanted in their hearts to understand what they were writing about and what it meant for for the coming of the Messiah. They wanted to know what it meant for when and how and what it would be like, but they weren't made privy to that. They weren't, that wasn't made known to them. But what was made known to them is that they were writing for us. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. So Jonah, when he's writing this chapter 2, when this song or this prayer of his heart is recorded in his book, this is amazing to me because it is a, it's a foreshadowing of the death and burial of Jesus. 700 years in advance. And that's why Jesus quotes to those Pharisees and those teachers of the law who are jealous. Yeah, you're going to get a sign. It's going to be my burial. And then my resurrection. So chapter 2, verse 1. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. And he said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. I wonder if when Jesus' body lay in the tomb, if his spirit... (laughs) was calling to the Father, free me from death. And you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy Temple, the place of your presence. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. This was Jonah's experience, but I wonder if spiritually it was Jesus's also. (laughs) The earth beneath barred me in forever, or so it thought. (laughs) But you, Lord my God, brought me, brought my life up. You brought my life up from the pit. Is that what happened for your life when he saved you? When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes 
from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. We'll look more into the story and some of those details next week, but I want to drop down to verse 10 in chapter 3. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented. It's talking about the Ninevites who were living in violence against each other and their neighbors. They were worshiping idols and sacrificing their children to idols. And then they repented. When Jonah came and said, God's going to wipe you out if you don't turn from your evil ways, they turned. And when God saw what they did, And how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Remember Jesus, when he's telling about Jonah to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who are jealous, says, the Ninevites will be better than you on the day of the Lord because they repented and you are not recognizing the one who's in your presence right now. It says in chapter 4, the first three verses, But to Jonah, this idea that God was no longer going to wipe out the Ninevites seemed very wrong, and he became angry. (laughs) Don't we sometimes wish God would deal with people we don't like more harshly than he does? Jonah prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I... I tried to forestall or stop by fleeing to Tarshish, going the other direction. I was trying to keep this from happening, this idea that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. God, you're all wishy-washy, lovey-dovey, and you save people that repent when I would wipe them out, Jonah says. So now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live and watch you be gracious. (laughs) And while we're busy judging Jonah, haven't we all been there at some time or another? (laughs) But contrasting Jonah and Jesus, this is interesting. Both are called, both are gifted, but Jonah is double-minded. On the one hand, he, 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 uh, you know, he sort of obeys God, and on the other hand, he's totally hating what God is doing. Further, he's in disagreement with God's purposes. He, he just doesn't agree. God, my, my plan is way better than yours. I mean, isn't that kind of like us sometimes? We're like, God, I'm going to pray my will be done, not yours, as it is in me, may it be in heaven, (laughs) so that all things will align exactly as they should, as I can see they should be. And, you know, we're like that because we kind of, we think we know better sometimes, when the reality obviously, of course, is he's always knowing better. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are more profound, are are, are deeper than our thoughts. He's always working a strategy beyond what we've ever understood, and yet we can seek to understand. Lord, I want to lean on your understanding and not my own. Therefore, right, the Lord's prayer is, Father, your will on earth as it is in heaven. Your will, not my will. Wow. So Jonah was in disagreement with God's purposes because he thought he knew better how to take care of people that had been mean, malicious, vicious, Sinful, immoral, idolatrous, liars, 
schemers, slanderers, abusers. Because basically, unlike Jesus, who loves people sacrificially, Jonah hates people. I don't even think he liked his own people very much. He was a prophet who, who had an assignment to tell them how bad off they were, and I think he liked it. So he obeys God half of the time. But then even after obeying God, doesn't like the outcome of God's decisions at all and would rather die. I mean, what kind of thinking is that? I don't even want to live if this is the way the world is going to be. Oh, that's how we sometimes think, isn't it? And God's like, don't you get it? I saved you, and I want to save a lot more. <laughs> so stay active in the world. I brought life and, and blessing to you. I want to bring life and blessing to a lot more people, people you don't like, people who do things you don't think are right. <laughs> yeah, to them too. Of course he does. He's their maker. He's their creator. And he's not... He's never called us to be the judge. Has anybody ever been called to be the judge of mankind? No, of course, right? Not. And yet, we like to sit in judgment because it's, we like it. Why do we like that? I don't, I don't even know. I think it's partly our sin nature to judge our brother. I think it's the sin of Cain and Abel. It starts right in the garden. We will think we are like God after Eve and Adam sin. Cain and Abel already judging each other, or at least Cain judging Abel. So what about us? What about us? We're each called. You're called. God formed you. He knitted you together in your mother's womb. You're not an accident, and he has a design and many designs of beauty through your life to give to your family, to your friends, for the arc of your life to give out through your life into society things that are good. Wow. You're called. You're gifted. You're talented. And, and the question is, are we obedient or are we double-minded? Do we kind of work with his plan some of the time and the rest of the time we complain? That's the Jonah syndrome. The Jesus syndrome is you work with his plan even when it's hard. Right? Are we in agreement with God's purposes? Do we agree with the idea of it is His will that no one should perish or that no one should be damned to hell? Although there will be those who choose to stay outside of His grace, it's not what He wants. So it should never be what we want for anyone. In other words, don't take on the attitude of Jonah towards people who are far from God or even people who think they're Christians who act far from God. And then, you know, finally, are we loving people? Are we, I mean, that, that's, this is a hard question. It's like, well, ask me on a different day, right? That's, a, that's that kind of question. Ask me on a different day. Because we are human and we, we do get irritated and we do, we do kind of fall into temporal thinking instead of eternal perspective. It's so easy. It's every day. It's why every day start your day in the Lord. The Lord's prayer or His Word or both or just time of sitting and worshiping Him in private to align your heart with Him, which will also help your heart align with loving people. So what needs to change? The biggest difference between Jonah and Jesus was Jonah had no love, no love for people, and especially not for people living wickedly without God. And like we've already said, how much like that are we sometimes? And as Jesus loved people, he loved them so much that he laid down his life for them. He spent himself for them. Even when he was in his ministry, of course, we know the power of his, his self-sacrifice on the cross. 
But think about the times when he was tired from just being with crowds of people. Does anybody here ever get tired after being with crowds, right? That's, you know, it's a lot. But it's because we're giving out, we're receiving, but we're also giving out. And as we're doing that, we're giving life away, and so was Jesus. And there were times he needed to get alone to rest. And he would get alone to rest, but before long, the crowds would find him again. And what did he do? He didn't say, hey, get away from me. (laughs) He would sit down with them again. He would begin to minister to their needs. Again, he, he expended himself because he loved people. And he loved people enough to tell people the truth in love, like when he was doing that with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and say, hey, don't walk in your pride. You're in trouble if you do. But that was something he was doing with them in person. He wasn't slandering them. It was direct. So what about us? What about each one of us? In your life, here's a good question. Do God's purposes supersede or come above your own purposes? Or do, do we struggle to keep his, his, his purposes primary, first. If we're honest, our, our own preferences prevail a lot of the time, don't they? And that's something for us to think about. I think about Jesus, this is an intense example, but at the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before his crucifixion, even he was like, God, my, I would rather not do this. But nevertheless, your will be done. So if Jesus had that struggle, who are we to not have that struggle? Of course we're going to have that struggle. So don't be ashamed of having the struggle. Just work at in Him through Christ in you and His Spirit in you, ending up in the same place of nevertheless, Father, your will be done, not mine. Your purposes prevail, not mine. Your purposes above, not mine above. I remember when the Lord called Jan and me to Cincinnati. I remember we wanted to go to be missionaries in Eastern Europe. And I remember in prayer in our mid-20s, early 20s, mid-20s, the Lord said Cincinnati. And I remember going, "Uh, excuse me? What? And this is hometown for me. I love Cincinnati, but I had a heart and a desire, and I felt like God had put a lot of things in my life that went in that direction, and yet the Lord was clear, so clear that we knew we needed to obey Him, and so we did. We came three years later. Lord, now, Eastern Europe, former Yugoslavia, and the Lord said no. And he began to grow our hearts for you, for the people here, and for the people in this city. We didn't lose our love for Eastern Europe. We still together support missionaries among the least reached in the world, including in the Balkans. But here's where he wanted us to be. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Because if I had said, no, God, I know better. I'll do, I know he would have worked with me and all that, worked with us but we wouldn't be part of what God has us as a part of probably for the rest of our days together. I mean, for me anyway. You guys will outlive me, but. (laughs) In your life, how how good are you at loving people you disagree with? It's It's an important question for me, too. Do you speak respectfully about people you disagree with, or do you speak in other ways about them? That takes some work. And here's another question. When do you pray for your enemies? People who have been abusive? Can you forgive them? That's not easy. People who differ from you politically or in terms of their morality. uh, People who, who... do things that seem foolish and disappointing to you or maybe harmful and need to be addressed, but your heart attitude is, I wish God would address them by smiting them. You know, that's, we're all, we're human, and so that, that happens inside of us. But when do you pray for your enemies? Jesus called us to love them, and one of the best ways to love our enemies is to pray for them. 
And this is his call on humanity through salvation because of the cross. Jesus came and died for us while we were yet enemies to him, the Bible says. I was reading the story of a missionary uh, and her husband. Elizabeth Elliot's husband went to Ecuador to open communication with an unreached tribe. They had no access to the gospel. You know what they did? They murdered him and his four missionary friends. All of them young men at the time in their 20s or early 30s. Elizabeth had a 10-month-old little girl, so Jim, at his death, left a widow but also his daughter. A few years later, Elizabeth went back to that same people group and lived among them and made disciples of Jesus among them with her daughter. Talk about loving your enemies to see the purposes of God prevail. She wrote a book, Through Gates of Splendor. You can get it for yourself to listen to or to read. Through Gates of Splendor, Elizabeth Elliot. That was in the 1950s. Still today, there are, there are multiplying disciples of Jesus in that people group. They were a violent people group of 500. Today, they number over 4,000 because the violence dropped by 90%. The effects of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the Lord wants to bring into the earth through his gospel. But he can't if we won't love people we don't like. So in what ways do we serve? In what ways do we reach out? I'm proud of you, church. There's so many ways that you do this. Not least of which recently helping Nika with a a car in her life situation. We'll have more updates in the next couple of weeks. But these lessons from Jonah and, and, and Jesus that we can lift out work to comprehend God's purpose as well and love sinful people like he does. And unlike Jonah, don't get caught up in negativity about people that you might, in your own nature, you might despise them, but supernaturally through Christ in you, you love them. The end of Jonah chapter 3 concludes like this. That chapter says, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. May the Lord use us to bring good news to people far from him. Let's stand together. Father, thank you for how you teach us from your word to consider your ways which are higher than ours. Your purposes, which when they prevail, bring people into the kingdom. And Father, would your will be done in each of our lives as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen.